It gives me great pleasure to introduce our plenary, second plenary speaker, uh, Madhu Sudan. And for most of us, Madhu needs no introduction, but for the rest of us, I'll provide some background. So Madhu got his B.Tech from IIT Delhi in 1987. He got his uh, PhD from Berkeley in 92. He worked uh, in IBM Watson Research Center until 97. And then for the next 12 years, he worked with the MIT. In 2009, he joined Microsoft Research. Uh, he's currently also an adjunct professor at MIT. I first got to know about Madhusudan back in the mid-90s, 97, 96, when news filtered through a beaver in Marseille in France that of an exciting new development in coding theory called the Sudan algorithm. And so a lot of us rushed to find out what it was all about. Later on, we learned that it was the, the list decoding algorithm, uh, the first one, and then subsequent uh, more uh, uh, a more deeper result uh, got the IT uh, joint with Venkat Guruswami, got the IT Best Paper Award uh, for the year 2000. So uh, Madhu's work is at the interface of uh, communication and computation, and he's made many stellar contributions to computer science, and I'm not really competent to talk about those. But one thing I will mention is his contribution to probabilistically checkable proofs, PCPs, and uh, uh, this contribution, uh, or at least one part of it, is referred to as the PCP theorem. And basically for all the reviewers in the audience, it's good news because what it says is that in order to actually check whether a paper is correct or not, you don't have to read the proof. At least you don't have to read most of the proof. Okay? But the catch is that as an author, you have to write it in a prescribed format. Okay? And that could take some time. Uh, there seems to be a trade-off between uh, writing and checking, but uh, people are working on it. Uh, for this work, Madhu and other co-workers received the prestigious Godel Prize in 2001. Uh, there are many other awards that uh, Madhu has won, including the Neville Lina Prize in 2002 and the newly founded Infosys Prize from India for Mathematical Sciences in 2014. He's a fellow of uh, IEEE, ACM and AMS. Today he'll talk to us about locality in coding theory. This notion of locality, I might mention, is related but slightly different from that of locally repairable codes, which has caught hold in this community. Uh, this notion of locality also has strong ties to theoretical computer science as well. And uh, Madhu will tell us all about it. With that, I'll request Madhu to come and give a talk. Does anybody know how to set this up? So thanks very much, Vijay, for the introduction. Thanks to all of you for uh, coming in this early in the morning. Uh, when they said that they're going to schedule this talk at this time, I figured probably because nobody else wants to hear about this. Um, but thanks anyway for showing up. Uh, I'll tell you about uh, a notion of, uh, 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 of uh, <clears throat> a feature that one can associate with error correcting codes and basic tasks in error correcting codes, which is called locality. And uh, to set the stage, let me, let's make sure we're all on the same page. I'll reintroduce notation for error correcting codes, but pre pretty much stuff that's probably familiar to most of you. So we're going to be talking about linear error correcting codes. These are go going to be codes over some large alphabet, finite field of size Q. Codes are going to have length n. The dimension of a code will be uh, all equivalently called the message length as k. The rate of the code is the ratio k over n. And just this one thing, which is, tends to be more common amongst the computer scientists, is we're going to measure Hamming distance normalized. So it's going to be some number between 0 and 1. And the larger it is, is the better the code is. So it's going to be the ratio of uh, uh, the distance between, minimum distance between code words and the length n. All right. Um, now, basic algorithmic tasks that we associate with error correcting codes are encoding, testing, which will say is a given word a code word or not, and correcting to say if I give you a word with a few errors, can you find out the code word which is near this, uh, 
near this word. Uh, these tasks um, are sort of fundamental to the usage of error correcting codes and to these tasks we'll be putting in a new perspective today which is the perspective of locality. Now locality as a concept in algorithms has been emerging f over the last 20 years. This is a concept which says in order to be able to compute some function on some input, maybe I don't have to read the whole input and maybe I can do something which is faster than writing the whole output. You might say how can this ever be possible? Well this is possible if I'm allowed to do random access to the inputs and I can just sample portions of the input and do some computation on it and I provide you with sort of random access to the output which means if you say I want location i of the output somebody says okay here is that particular value quickly without telling you everything else. And in general these kinds of algorithms have to be probabilistic. You cannot have a deterministic algorithm which will decide always to go look at a particular place in order to compute this thing. They will sample the input randomly and produce the output from that. And this is a me metaphor that has been applied to a wide collection of questions like I give you a graph and I ask you how many triangles there are. You can probably estimate it. You can ask the question is this graph colorable with three colors. You can estimate it. But first place where these concepts were actually applied were to the basic tasks in coding theory. And let me tell you a little bit briefly about what kinds of things we might want to do with in the concept context of coding theory which would in, uh, involve sublinear time algorithms. The first task that we can think about is the task of testing if some word is a code word. I give you a large you know think of a big disk which all the data has been encoded with an error correcting code on this disk and I give it to you and I say well is this really a, you know an uncorrupted DVD or has this got lots of errors on it. There is no reason in principle that you should be able to require it to scan the entire DVD in order to be able to estimate the amount of errors maybe you can do it by random sampling. Codes that allow this will be called locally testable codes and these are codes to which we will have a tester associated with it which will sample some coordinates and try to say are there many errors or are there not. Okay. I'll give you a formal definition in the next page but this is roughly the principle that we want to work with. Now a second task that you could talk about are what we will call locally correctable codes. Um, if some of you have heard about locally decodable codes these are more or less the same concepts for today I will just talk about correctable codes. These are codes where you have sublinear time correctors. So I give you a corrupted code word but not too many corruptions have happened. So you have a disk with a few scratches in it and you would like to find out what sits in a particular block or a particular location. You don't care what sits in the rest of it. You're not trying to correct the whole thing right now. I just want to read this one piece of information. Can we do this? A locally correctable code is one that supports this. It will come equipped with a local corrector which is an algorithm which will make a few samples and try to determine that particular location for you. Okay. Uh, these are the basic tasks that we will want to associate. Now a little bit of formalism trying to tell you what kinds of parameters are interesting and how do you exactly crisply formalize these two questions. There's a certain amount of ambiguity that's allowed at this stage. Hopefully after the next slide there will be no amount of amb ambiguity. Okay. A locally testable code will have two parameters. Ignore the epsilon. Epsilons are always there saying well not everything is going to happen with probability 1. So an epsilon amount of error is allowed. The main parameter is that called locality L and this is a core <coughs> a testing algorithm which will make given a word an ambient a word in the uh, ambient space uh, n letters over the alphabet of the code. It will make L of n queries. Hopefully L of n is much much less than n. Um, maybe a constant maybe you know square root of n something much smaller than n. And it should have two features. If you are given a code word not a single error has happened you must accept with probability 1. Okay. So you are given a code word you must say look this is a code word no errors have happened. If you are given a word which is far from the code you must reject. 
but you are allowed some grace. It's, if you are very, very, very close to a code word, then you can reject with very, very, very tiny probability. If you are very far from the code, you must reject with high probability. Recall the delta, the normalized Hamming distance is some number between 0 and 1. The maximum that you ever expect this quantity to be is 1. And if you are totally like you are a random word, have never came from a code word, then you must be rejected with probability epsilon. And in between, you should scale linearly with the distance from the code. If you have only 1 over n errors, you'll reject with probability epsilon over n. You'll barely reject. But if you are moderately far, then you'll reject with constant probability. Okay? That's the definition of an L epsilon locally testable code. Very soon, I will give you examples of locally testable codes and locally correctable codes that will allow you to ground some of these parameters, but that's the very basic definition. The complementary notion, see, a locally testable code is one where you can see if many errors have occurred or not. But if you know that not too many errors have occurred, what do you do with it? The locally correctable codes will be ones where if you have few errors, then you can actually do useful things with them. What's useful? Well, I give you a local access to a word u, which is promised to be some close to some code word v. And it's so close that it's the nearest code word is unique. So, and then I give you a location i, which is an index between 1 and n. And I say, give me the ith coordinate of v, the code word which is nearby. And the locally correctable code should have this corrector associated with it which will make a few probes, L of n probes again, into this oracle for uh, the oracle that you're given. So the word that you're given is always corrupted. That's what you can access. And it makes L of n queries to that and tells you what is V sub i, the ith location. Okay? And this should be holding true for any index i that you make. The probability that you're allowed to make an error is something modest, but it should be uh, relatively small. That's the expectation, and uh, these are the two concepts that we want to talk about today. All right? Okay, so as I said, we'll just ignore this epsilon parameter, which is allowed, you know, stuck in there to make things, you know, okay. Um, you, you will never get epsilon equal to zero. You'll always have to work with some positive epsilon. We will always try to work with some positive epsilon. Think of it as 1%. We're done. The focus is going to be on the locality that we can obtain, and the question is how good parameters we can get over here. And along the way, I'll tell you about basic examples and also some motivations. Why did we in computer science start looking at these questions? So what's the outline of this talk? We've already seen the definitions of locally testable and correctable codes. I'll start with an elementary construction which will give you a little bit of familiarity with these notions so that you don't have to remember the parameters and so on and so forth. Just you know, you can sort of concretely think about these things. Give you a little bit of historical and current motivation for why to study these things. And then give you, uh, part three of this talk is probably the most important one that I want to tell you a lot about because in the last th four to five years, there have been some fantastic developments in this field which take local locality from a concept that you might want to occasionally think about to a case that you might really say, maybe I can use it now. And uh, so I'll tell you about some of these beautiful constructions that have come up in the last few years and just give you some concluding thoughts at the end. All right, so what's the most uh, elementary construction that we can come up with for error correcting codes? Let me just start by putting in a disclaimer. You can say, look, let's look at the most favorite codes that we have. Are they locally testable? If you pick a maximum distance separable code, it is about as far from locally testable or correctable as you can get. So you don't want to head in the most natural direction. You have to do something different in order to make a code actually locally testable or correctable. So, but it turns out not too far. If you look at a book on algebraic coding theory, the first example might be Reed-Solomon codes and the second example are Reed-Muller codes. The Reed-Muller codes are good enough for us. So our main example here is Reed-Muller codes. For those of you who don't know what they are, a message over here is just given by a multivariate polynomial. In several variables, think two variables. It's good enough for almost all the intuition that we want to convey today. Encodings 
are going to be evaluations of this multivariate polynomial on the entire domain. Recall that we are working over finite fields. So the finite fields in m variables, there's a finite domain. And we just take, so there'll be three parameters, number of variables m, the degree of the polynomial r, and the field size q that you're working with. Once you specify the three, the Reed-Muller codes with these parameters are unique, are pretty much completely defined. And uh, <clears throat> the code words consist of all the polynomials whose degree is at most r in m variables. And uh, its encoding is the evaluation over all the points in the space. Okay? So this is a, hopefully a familiar old-fashioned definition. Where do these codes give you locality? And the claim is as long as m is greater than 1. m equal to 1, you get Reed-Solomon codes, not very interesting. m equal to 2, good enough, will give you some locality. Where is the locality coming from? So we will consider the case where r is less than q during this talk, though the case where r is greater than or equal to q has also been very well studied. And there are some remarkable, nice mathematical theorems about those cases. For for a first look, r less than q is good enough. In this case, we can use one very simple property of polynomials. When I take a low degree polynomial in m variables, restrict it to a line in this space, it will be a polynomial of at most the same degree. Okay? So a univariate, it'll, you'll get a univariate function whose degree is at most r. A univariate polynomial of degree at most r is still somewhat constrained when you have q evaluations. So it's not going to be, you're going to see some local constraint on the values of this function on this line. And you're only looking at q points in the space out of a total length of q to the m. There is locality already. Think m equal to 2. A line has square root of n many points. And so in bivariate polynomials, Locality is already that you're getting is instead of looking at a code word of length n, you're looking at a line which is about square root of n evaluations. Okay? Um, and the second thing that turns out to be very useful in the analysis of these objects is when you take random lines in FQ to the M, they are sampling points in the space randomly. In fact, if you take any two points, the probability that the two of them are contained in the line is exactly one in Q one in something squared, I forget what's the number, but it's, you know. Um, all right, so pictorially, this is how your local decoding algorithm is going to work. Let's say you're looking at some three variate function over here. You, your corrupted code word might be evaluations associated with each point in the cube, some value in the finite field at each point in the cube. This should have been the values of a degree R polynomial but some subset of these points end up being corrupted. Okay? A local decodability question says, I would like to find the value of the correct polynomial at that point, which is chosen to be smack in the center of these erroneous points. How would you do it? Well, the idea is very simple. You take your function and pick a random line which passes through the point. Since the line is a pairwise independent collection of points, any other point on this line is still a random point in the whole space. The probability that it is corrupted is still small because the total number of corruptions is small. So on this line, you tend to have relatively few errors. And your function should look like a degree r polynomial. What you will be seeing is a degree r polynomial with a few errors. This is like a Reed-Solomon decoding question on this line. And you can solve this problem and thereby can figure out what was the value of the polynomial of degree r that best fits this line, evaluate that polynomial here, and that gives you the value of the code word at this point. Okay? This is a very, very basic elementary example of how local decoding is supposed to work. I, in order to look at the whole code word, I would have to look at every point in this three-dimensional space. In order to do a local decoding, I only needed to look at this line, and the line is sort of one, th so n to the one-third size of the space in this example. In general, with m variables, n to the one-nth. So that tells you how the local decoding would happen. This is just sort of saying everything in words. The testing 
is very similar. You pick a fun you're given a function, you're asking, is this close to being a low degree polynomial? You pick a random line and you say, on this line, am I getting a low degree polynomial? It turns out that it works, not always, it works in some cases. Uh, if the degree is sort of less than q over 2, the analysis is a bit easier and then if not, there's more complications to be uh, dealt with. The analysis is not really trivial. For the decoding, I almost gave you the analysis right there in front of you. Testing turns out to be a fair amount of work, but it can be done. And it basically says if usually the degree of this polynomial restricted to various lines is at most r, there is actually an r variate, m variate polynomial of degree at most r, which explains most of this function. So you are actually close to a code word. Now, let's talk a little bit about the parameters. I've emphasized this already, if n is q to the m, the size of the domain, if you are working over a field of size q, there are m variables, that's the size of the domain. The locality, we are only looking at a single line, so the locality is q. And that works out to being n raised to the power of 1 over m. m equal to 2, you are already sublinear, you are looking at much less than the whole code. As m becomes larger and larger, you get less and less, you know, the locality becomes better and better. But we are paying a price for the locality and that's that comes from the fact that the rate of the code is at best going to be something like 1 over m factorial. Okay? <coughs> that just comes from the fact that even if you're looking in the bivariate case, you're asking how many monomials are there whose degree is less than or equal to r. r is at most q the number of monomials of degree of at most q in two variables is roughly q squared over 2. Okay? And that's where the best rate you're going to get out of this is at most one half, even if you want some sublinear locality. But it's a good starting example. It's already giving you a flavor for how locality works. And we're going to work with this um, example for the rest of the talk. Oops. Right, so the ideas can be extended to the case where r is greater than q, but we won't talk much about that. I'll tell you a little bit briefly about some of the motivations. I actually have three slides on details about some of these, but I'm actually going to skip those today because uh, I find it may be a little too detailed uh, to talk about those today, but do feel free to look at the slides. So this is the subliminal channel. Uh, you can look at the slides later and uh, catch up with some of the other questions. Now, the motivation, you know, the way I described it, there's sort of a natural practical motivation. You know, maybe we really want to encode uh, massive data. And I want to give you a little bit of a perspective on this, though really this was not the reason why we started looking at it. If you have massive amounts of data, there's a very natural idea on how to encode it. You just take this whole data and encode it using one big error correcting code. So if you have DVD sized amounts of data, you have you know, I know gigabytes of data, you just put one huge error correcting code which is a gigabyte long and work with it. Actually nobody ever works with uh, error correcting codes of that size on the disk that we are working with. Well, one reason might be on the one hand you get very good reliability out of it. Why? Because we know that the probability of a failure, too many errors occurring, is going to be exponentially small in the size of this chunk. So that's great news, right? I mean this is the longer and longer and longer you make the message size and the encoding size, the more reliable your data is getting. But on the other hand, if you're going to recover any amount of information, you have to scan the entire disk before you can start to recover things. That's the traditional solution that's extremely time inefficient. The alternate, which is the, ten, the solution we tend to practice, is you take this huge amount of data, break it up into a lot of small chunks, you encode each one separately. The recovery time is now proportional to the length of the small chunks, but the probability of failure is the number of chunks that you have times the probability of failure of a piece. This number is much higher than what you had there, and it's further driven up by the fact that you're taking the union bound over the number of pieces. So you're losing twice because of this, uh, uh, this way of approaching the question. If good locally decodable codes were available, where the locality of recovery was 
proportional to the size of the small pieces. On the other hand, uh, the whole code was being uh, encoded in a single locally uh, decodable, locally uh, correctable code, then you would really get the best of both worlds in principle. So we don't have great solutions at the moment, but this is something that's conceivable and this is the kind of uh, one of the motivations. Now, this is the actual uh, motivation that led us towards these, uh, um, I, I mean sorry, this is the uh, motivation that describes what the questions that you are looking at are and tries to convey to you that these are actually natural questions. But what really led us to these things, oh sorry, uh, I'll do a little bit of an aside over here. Uh, I do want to talk about, I guess this should have been locally repairable codes, not reconstruction codes, but I missed my mistake. Uh, some other notions of locality have been in the literature, especially in coding theory in the recent past. I want to tell you a little bit about those and how they compare with this. Uh, now local reconstruction codes or locally repairable codes are those where you can recover from very few errors. Typically the number of errors that we are talking about are one or two or a constant number of errors, not a constant fraction of the code word being corrupted. And we do want to recover from very few errors or erasures locally, but if there are more errors then you don't mind global uh, effort to recovering. In our case we are really focusing on the setting where we just have one sort of a upper bound. This many errors we should be able to recover locally, anything more, no more guarantees at this stage. Um, also the concepts called regenerating codes which have been uh, explored in this community uh, are very closely related. There I would think of as the pattern for recovery is somewhat more restricted. You partition your code word into various servers and you want to say each server is accessed for relatively few pieces of information. So there are there is a partition and you are asking for a few symbols per partition during the decoding. These are related in a sense if you start with some regenerating code it does have some sublinear locality in our sense of the word. If you are starting with local reconstruction codes it also implies some sort of locality in our sense. But these are not corresponding and once you decide that these are the concepts that you are interested in your optimizations might lead you to very different kinds of codes and parameters. The main differences I should stress, in local correctability we are talking about a large number of errors, a constant fraction of the code words are being corrupted and that's what we want to recover from. Whereas in these concepts typically the number of erasures that you want to deal, recover from locally is very small. The other thing is just historically the kind of work that we have seen in local correctability, the emphasis has been on the asymptotics, what happens when the code length gets to be large. And uh, whereas in the local uh, repairability sense, in the regeneration sense, people have really been looking at it in very, very concrete settings of the parameters. So what you can get over here is very impressive and over there what you are going to see is the limits of what is possible. All right, so <coughs> in the theoretical computer science community, we were really interested in the concept of locality because it allowed us to do a remarkable collection of things. Um, many, many, many algorithmically infeasible sounding tasks allowed us could be now done very, very locally because of uh, concepts uh, such as locally testable codes. Just the possibility made them uh, exist. A few things, uh, Vijay mentioned probabilistically checkable proofs. Yes, it's actually true that there are these objects which work as proofs. You can, you know, proofs are just a piece of data you look at it and anal analyze it and it tells you that some property is true. You can actually encode this data in an error correcting code and if it happens to be locally testable and has a few other f features, then it turns out that the, you can actually verify not only that the data is mostly correct, but it also has the property that you believe it should have. Okay, so th these works on probabilistically checkable proofs use specific error correcting codes and the feature that they are locally testable and correctable. It is not a generic application of local testability or correctability, but it was an application of in particular the fact that Reed Muller codes are locally testable. That's very fundamental to these results. Uh, a second category of results that we are able to do 
in cryptography, for example, it's very useful to have functions which are very, very hard to compute. Okay? It's not good enough to say occasionally your cryptographic key will be hard to invert. It's good to know that every one of you is using keys which are hard to invert. So you want to have functions where when you pick a random key and encrypt things, things are actually secure. To get these kinds of functions which are hard when you pick everything at random, we've struggled very hard to be able to convert standard assumptions which only talk about occasional hardness or even worst case hardness uh, to hardness on most instances, it was very hard for, uh, it was very, you know, complicated to come up with these constructions. And then when we started discovering locally correctable codes, they were just completely modular techniques which would allow us to convert results about occasional hardness into results about overwhelming hardness. So we won't go into the details, but these were one of the motivations for studying locally correctable codes. Finally, there's, you know, Whenever you're looking at error correcting codes, these are combinatorial objects with some extremal parameters. You are, these are points in space which are about as well separated as you can. Locality is an extra feature associated with these things which is compelling and useful in a combinatorial sense. One concrete way of expressing this is in some recent constructions due to Barak et al. and Gopalan et al. where they say whenever you give me a locally testable code, I can convert it into a graph which actually happens to have on the one hand when you look at the adjacency matrix of this graph and look at all the eigenvalues, they really look like this graph should not be expanding. On the other hand, when you look at actually the combinatorics of this graph, they are very, very, very vastly expanding when you look at small enough sets. So very strange extremal objects and combinatorics can be constructed using objects like locally testable codes. So these are extremal objects in combinatorics. They are very useful in computational complexity along the lines of allowing us to construct very strange, uh, very new and useful primitives. So that's roughly been the motivation for why computer scientists have been looking at it. There's a few slides here, like I said, about PCPs, but I'm going to skip them. And uh, I'm going to start jumping into, whoops, recent on locally correctable codes and locally testable codes. And these are elements of progress which I think should bring these objects much closer to your community. And let me explain why. So till 2010, roughly the best known locally correctable codes that we knew about were the Reed-Muller codes. Okay, so you want any locality, you have to use M at least two. That gives you locality of square root of n. Instead of reading n things, you're reading square root of n. That's a good advantage. But immediately, your rate went down to at most one half. You want to have codes which have locality 80%, uh, which have rate 80%, you have to decode it by reading the entire code word. Okay? That's pretty much what we knew till, till 2010. In 2015, today, the story is the following. We can get codes of rate arbitrarily close to 1, and the locality is n raised to some power which is strictly going to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay? Any amount that you can, you know, you want to get a code of locality n to the 0.99, uh, n to the 0 0.01, there is 1. In fact, it's even better than that. It's actually going, there is an explicit little low of 1 function goes off to 0 as n goes to infinity. This is a dramatic improvement. The locality much better than what we could achieve earlier and the rate much better than what you could achieve earlier. Let me even translate it into other forms which are even more compelling. You can get codes of this kind of locality, it's much, much, much less than linear, which meet roughly the singleton bound. What is the singleton bound? If you want to be able to have distance between code words which is 20%, the singleton bound says the rate is at most 1 minus 20 percent, which is 80 percent. We can get codes of rate 80 percent, where the distance is 20 percent, and locally you can correct 10 percent errors, half the distance. Or if you want binary codes, these are going to be codes over large alphabets. Singleton bound is not tight over small alphabets, there are better upper bounds. 
If you want binary, the best explicit codes asymptotically that we know about still are the Zyablov uh, construction, are from the Zyablov construction. The Zyablov bound tells us what's the rate and distance performance of these uh, explicit codes. We're going to get explicit codes of the same feature and locality again n to the little o of 1. So in some senses, we are paying no price whatsoever for the sublinear locality and we are meeting the best known upper, uh, bounds that we can get for these things. All these cases, we will be locally correcting half the distance of the codes, uh, that many errors. Okay? So these are really, really compelling theoretical results. And now it's up to us to say, well, okay, there's going to be some obviously constants hidden in the asymptotics. Let's try and make these constants better. But that's where the energy needs to be focused on now. Still, I think we've come a far cry from where we were just five years back. And the remarkable thing about these results is actually the codes are not really very hard to describe. So hopefully I'll be able to describe most of these codes today to you and why they work. So uh, first I'll talk about a little bit about the history of how these developments happen. In 2010, Koparthi, Saraf, and Yekhanen, uh, actually researchers, uh, Yekhanen was at Microsoft and the two of them were interns at Microsoft, um, ended up uh, building these codes that I'll call, describe uh, later to you, multiplicity codes, which allowed us to get beyond rate one half, closer to rate one, but only the rate close to one was the only setting that we could work with in this case. Uh, later, in some uh, works with Guo and Koparty, and then Hemingway, Ostrovsky, and Wouters, uh, gave alternate constructions of codes which were able to attain such parameters. And these were all locally correctable, but not necessarily testable. Uh, following the work of Koparty, Saraf, and Yekhanen, but then in using completely unrelated ideas, Widerman gave codes which were locally testable. And uh, these codes I might not able to be able to describe today, but so got also local testability with similar parameters. Um, turned out our codes were both decodable and testable simultaneously. And then came this very beautiful result this year, which says that if you take a very well-known composition operator on codes, which will translate codes of a certain type into codes of a different type, you can get all the benefits that I spoke about in the last slide, you know, all the right parameters. So what am I going to do in this talk today? I'm going to start with what I believe is the simplest example of codes of rate greater than one half and uh, tell you about those. Then I'll tell you about the multiplicity codes which are probably the best performing codes amongst this collection that we have over here. And uh, finally describe the idea behind this alone Lobby composition which allows us to get all the parameters that we talked about in the previous thing. In each case, I mean, you don't have to remember any of this thing in the slide. Just, just to provide a little bit of context, I'll go through these constructions. Constructions will be relatively simple, one or two slides long, and that's it. And you'll be able to see why they work and how they work. So the lifted codes are probably the ones that uh, ought to qualify in these 99 biggest career mistakes for me. Uh, these are codes obtained by inverting the decoder. What do I mean by inverting the decoder? So recall, we had this decoder for reed muller codes. You want to decode the value of a trivariate point polynomial at that point, you draw a random line through this point, and then decode along this line. Okay? Now you can ask this question, what code does it decode? Okay? This is a trick question. Doesn't it sound like a trick question? We just said it decodes the reed muller code. No, the answer is wrong. That's not the correct answer. What we proved was that the Reed-Muller code is a subcode of the code that it decodes. There could be a bigger code out there which is actually decoded by the same algorithm. Right? We said if you're close to a Reed-Muller code word, we will be able to decode it. But maybe there's a bigger code which, is contain, which contains the Reed-Muller code which is decoded by this algorithm. Okay? What is that code? Well, that should be the code of all functions in M variables such that when you look at this function and restrict it to any line, you get a degree R polynomial. Now, isn't that equivalent to being a polynomial in M variables of degree at most R? The answer is no. Not when your field is not a prime field. Okay? It's a striking statement. 
We knew this in 1995 and never realized that this actually means good news. It means that the code that we are able to decode is actually much bigger than the code that we are working with. Much bigger we didn't know. We knew it was strictly bigger. What we realized in 2013 was that this was actually a much, much bigger code. You work with this example with <coughs> fields of, which are prime powers, like 2 to the t, where t is going off to infinity. Take m to be a constant, 2, 3, 4, or something. The rate of these codes actually goes off to 1. Okay? Instead of being 1 over m factorial, it's approaching 1. So, you know, once you decide this is what you want to prove, it's not a lot of algebra to prove it. It's very straightforward compared to the rest of the work that goes into analyzing these codes and their performance. The rate is really relatively simple combinatorics. Turns out that's the case. So you actually look at the same, you fix the decoding algorithm, you're looking for the best code that it works for, the maximal code that it works for. It's actually a strictly larger set. Very surprising works and actually in terms of concrete parameters these are great because if you ever were willing to work with a Reed Muller code of, with some parameters, this is just saying you're going to get the same distance with the super code and you're going to have much, many more code words. Okay? That's it. So nothing else changes really. The local testability of these codes turns out to require some analysis but we had already done some prep work for it well before and we have much better analyses uh, very recently. All right. So that was example number one, lifted codes. You didn't see why the rate was approaching one, but you can sort of see what is the kind of question you need to analyze to analyze the rate and some combinatorics which leads you there. Example number two is going to be uh, a second family of codes which end up being um, uh, uh, getting you rate close to one. And this example that I'll give you will get you to rate two-thirds, arbitrarily close to two-thirds, but it's greater than one-half. And then I'll tell you what you need to do to push the rate up to one. And here again, what's the message? It's coefficients of some polynomial. Okay. And the encoding are evaluations. So that sounds like Reed-Muller codes again, right? So yes, I didn't tell you everything. Evaluations of what? Usually, when you evaluate polynomials, you just evaluate them, the value of the function there. Here, we're going to take two more related polynomials. If you give me a polynomial P, I'll also take a partial derivative with respect to X and partial derivative with respect to Y. These derivatives have to be what's called the Hasse derivatives, but first derivatives, it doesn't really matter. They're all the same. So, I'll take this polynomial and its derivative with respect to x and derivative with respect to y and evaluate them. Why is this any better? I took a polynomial of some degree. I now am evaluating three different polynomials on the entire space. I'm only making the rate go even down further. Right? Well, where we're going to gain is that we are now going to use polynomials of higher degree than we were previously allowed. Previously, we would have taken polynomials of degree at most q, r less than or equal to q. Now, we're going to look at polynomials whose degree is going to be greater than q, and that will allow us to have rate going all the way to two-thirds. How do you decode these things? Once again, you look at the function restricted it to lines. That gives you enough information to be able to reconstruct the value of the things. So the locality you'll get is still around square root of n and the rate is now going to go up to two-thirds. I'll tell you how the rate goes up to two-thirds in a moment, but just to explain how this works further, if you want to have higher rate, you take even more multiplicities and even higher degree polynomials, and that will allow you to go to rate one. If you want the locality to go to n to the one-third, n to the one-fourth, etc., you take more and more derivatives, and that will, uh, sorry, that should be, that's not derivatives, that should be more variables and that should give you uh, locality uh, n to the epsilon for any epsilon you care. Okay. This is again very, very, very simple error correcting codes. Not very different from the Reed-Muller codes that we've been working with. We're just augmenting them with a few other coordinates. Why does it work so well? Why is the rate going up? <coughs> if you look at this, the triple of evaluations that we have, the polynomial p, its derivative at x, and its derivative at y. 
Suppose all three are zero at a particular point. This corresponds to saying that this polynomial has two zeros at that point. Okay, it's really, I mean, this is basic calculus. All the derivatives are vanishing at some point, then the polynomial has a zero of multiplicity two at that point. And what that tells you is if on a line you find lots of points which are vanishing with multiplicity two, then actually this polynomial is identically zero on this line. So you can actually work with polynomials of degree close to 2q and still be able to say that its value on these lines are not unconstrained, they have to be constrained because it cannot be all zeros. All these derivatives and the polynomials cannot just vanish on this line uh, at more than q, at more than r over two points and that gives you the thing that we can use polynomials of degree tending to 2q. Now when you let look at polynomials of degree about 2q over two variables, how does this scale? Well, you know, you're doubling the x degree, you're doubling the y degree. So you're quadrupling the space of the number of monomials you can work with. On the other hand, you're making three valuations. So the rate goes up by a factor of four thirds and that four thirds is taking you from a rate upper bound of one half to a rate upper bound of two thirds. So the dimension went up by factor four, encoding length by factor three. And this is exactly the same reason, for example, that multiplicity improved the radius of list decoding in previous algorithms that Guruswami and I had come up with. But now this is actually being used as an encoding principle and this is really pretty and uh, works extremely nicely. In fact, this is uh, using lifter, uh, the multiplicity codes with more variables and more derivatives, we are getting the best performance that we can for local decodable, locally decodable codes. All right, so this brings us to the state of the art as of an year ago. Okay. What we are able to do, we are able to get codes of locality n to the epsilon for any epsilon that you choose, positive. And uh, depending on the rate that you want to choose, you can also take the rate as close to one as you want. But depending on the alpha and the epsilon that you choose, your distance suffers. So the distance becomes less and less and less. And this is all we were able to get till 2014. And you know, I actually promised you much more. I said the locality will be n to the little o of one. It's not that. I said you will get to the singleton bound, the Ziablo bound. None of this was, you know. So we really thought this is some ex, you know, extreme corner of the parameter space. You can get very good rate, but you know, Maybe if you really want to correct 20% errors, nothing interesting is going to happen. And all of this was fixed by a beautiful work of Orr Mayer, who used, uh, so Orr Mayer, who used this uh, alone Luby transformation on codes. So this is a transformation which starts with some very small code. Think of a constant size code with a certain rate and a certain distance and brings, brings you big codes with almost the same rate, almost the same distance and many algorithmic features in addition thrown into them. I'll try to describe that particular construction first. So bear with me as I walk through the steps of that construction. And uh, then we will see um, what we want to do with it in our case. So the alone Luby transformation builds an error correcting code where you have some number of message words. And it says the first thing we will do is use some code whose rate is very close to one and uh, make it a little bit error tolerant. So the rate of this code is very close to one, so its distance cannot be very large, but it's a little bit. And we'll use it a little, this is now a little bit more error tolerant than previously, but not really in any particularly interesting ways. So what happens over here, we haven't lost much in the rate. We've got a little bit of resilience. Now we'll take this new code, code word that we have, just partition the coordinates into small piece chunks and now comes the small size code that we are trying to mimic on a large scale. We'll just apply the short, say an MDS code or something or the other in each one of these little blocks. Okay, so this block has been blown up and this one is being blown up. You lose something in the rate but maybe because each one is a short code which is MDS, etc., you get as much distance as you can hope for for the rate loss. And now what you will do is this particular thing is itself not a great error correcting code. 
expander like graph between the left side and the right side, connect these pieces and move pieces over in some weird ways. Take the first piece of that chunk, move it here. Take the second piece, move it there and maybe the third piece moves it here. And now I'll get uh, a new collection of symbols and I just view the new code as a code word over alphabets of that size. Okay? If you do this, you get codes which are really great. Okay? We've done nothing except move symbols around, but then we are also partitioning it so that these are codes over a big alphabet. And that big alphabet collection makes a big, really very nice, provably good properties. This is a transformation that comes from about the mid-90s, I think, and uh, turns out to be very simple, but actually very effective, at least in the theoretical sense. The codes that you will get over here will have effectively, see, you lost, lost nothing in the rate here, because you really have a permutation of symbols over here. You lost almost nothing in the rate here. The rate that you get lo lost is all in the middle layer. And it turns out, if you do this permutation with large enough symbols over here, you will recover the distance that you got in the middle layer. So the re resulting code, which takes the message over here and produces an encoding like that, will turn out to have the rate and the distance of the middle layer, but now these are actually big objects, not small ones. Why is this useful in our context? Well, you can, so like I said, the rate and the distance of the final code are comparable to the rate and the distance of the middle layer. But if the first layer happens to be locally decodable or locally correctable, then the entire construction will be locally constructible. You know, everything else is a very local operation on its own. I mean, I just looked at this piece to produce that piece. If I look at all the pieces there, I can recover all the pieces here, usually. The decoding from this side to that side is just moving symbols around. You don't do anything. So if I want to recover from one of these blocks from this side, you just need to look at various pieces corresponding to those lines and just write them, copy the symbols. Everything else is local. It's this process that needs to be local, and we have codes of locality close to one, which are very, very local. So now what you are able to do by this construction is, sorry, is actually get to the singleton bound and, um, uh, you know, with as good locality as you had in the first layer over here, more or less. You pay a little bit more constant factors larger because of the later stages, but really negligible features. And to get sub-polynomial locality, how do you get there? Well, we just apply the previous transform where the initial code is not even of rate 1, but just close to 1. This transformation can actually co work with codes of rate little less than 1 in the first stage and put in constant distance, sorry, uh, distance less than a little low of one in the first stage and build it up to constant distance in the second stage. So that was it. That was all it apparently took. And now we have codes of uh, all the features that I described. The singleton bound. If you want to get to the Ziablov bound, you do the usual concatenation like a la Forni. You would be able to get that. And uh, you now have all the features that I did wanted to describe. You have codes of rate, one minus little low of one. Uh, the locality is little o of 1 and you can get anywhere along the singleton bound as you want also if you prefer. So that's the constructions of the locally testable codes. These are, I think even if you didn't follow the constructions, just the theorems themselves are quite remarkable and I sort of encourage you to look at more details. Uh, very briefly, a little bit about conc uh, 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 concluding thoughts. We are able to get um, asymptotically the best known parameters that you could for uh, explicit codes over here. The locality that we are getting is something like 2 to the square root of log n using the best choices of parameters. But yeah, it's a very, very, very good uh, function. Much, much better than sublinear, which is all we might have wanted in the early stages. In terms of limits, what can you not get in terms of locality? We have very, very elementary results. There's results saying, due to Katz and Trevisan saying, if you want locally correctable codes and the locality is L of n, n must satisfy this, must be at least this quantity. It's interesting when L of n is constant or 
But the moment you say locality uh, is allowed to be log n, then maybe you have codes of linear rate. Maybe. We don't have explicit constructions doing anything like that, but we don't have any results ruling any of that. And in terms of local testability, not even this is known. Codes could have local testability where the tester makes three queries and these might be as good as the best LDPC codes that you have where the locality of the, uh, of the constraints is looking at three variables at a time. So really we, locally testable codes are LDPC codes and nothing separates them from those that we know about. So these are some fairly you know, basic questions that remain open. We don't know how to make uh, progress on that. And then just a little bit of, you know, why don't we see these codes in practice? I don't know. Uh, but maybe locality with many errors is not such a natural model. Why would you want to correct only decode one symbol when you know that there's like 5% errors and you should be trying to fix all 5% of these things? Well, one thing that local, uh, locally correctable codes allow you to do is to sort of prioritize which order in which you want to do the recovery. I want to recover these parts very quickly and the rest of them can carry on. Yeah, you can do that in the background and focus on the good stuff. So these are an interesting possibilities, but I don't know how closely it ties to any particular demands in, say, the context of big servers and distributed file uh, storage. So we don't know why, it, you know, if the m model that we have for recovery from errors actually matches something that we care about. Um, there's also this feature that all these codes are associated with randomized decoding schemes and randomized testing schemes and it's very hard to work with a randomized scheme in practice. So maybe that's some sort of an objection but really I mean what does randomness tell you? It says that you can take your randomness, hardwire it into your construction, just don't announce it to the channel and this is going to you know probably work very well most of the time. So shouldn't be an in principle objection but it does sort of, uh, you know, uh, pose some challenges. And then probably one usual possibility is whenever you're working with asymptotically large, you know, when you're looking, letting n go to infinity, k go to infinity, maybe there are some hidden constants. And indeed there are many hidden constants in these cases. So maybe, but that's just a sign saying we need to probably study it more in the specific settings that, of parameters that we are interested in to see what we can do. It's not a proof. The constructions that we have given are not a proof that other constructions don't exist. So to conclude, locality seems to be a new model. There are some remarkable effects that are possible. They do connect to very interesting questions in combinatorics and computer science. What remains open, and I hope many of you will follow it upon this, is to see if it's actually use it, usable as a storage mechanism. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu, for that uh, fascinating perspective on coding theory. We do have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Okay, so the question was, in small fields we can achieve the Ziabla bound, but do we also consider the stochastic model where errors are probabilistic or something. So um, when errors are probabilistic, it is our hope that you would be able to do a lot better uh, and indeed go up to the Shannon bound, uh, though I don't know of explicit results which do that. Uh, what I am aware of is in the early days, we dismissed the probabilistic model as too easy to solve uh, by just repetition or some such thing. Now, repetition is not a great idea when you're trying to get uh, optimal performance between rate and distance. But in the early days, we were very happy to get, you know, codes which would be of length less than k squared, you know, n is less than k squared, we would have been very happy. We said, oh, you know, uh, probabilistic model, we can do that very easily, so we dismissed it. I think now that we are seeing the right results, uh, in, the, in the worst case setting, it makes a lot of sense to go back and look at the uh, stochastic thing. I don't think it's been done. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I was wondering if you consider 
convolutional codes for this type of constructions? Uh, okay, so uh, not really. Uh, I, would, I would confess that I'd have to figure out exactly what settings and parameters and convolutional codes might allow us some locality in the recovery. But uh, I, I guess one of the answers to many of the questions over here is we've been sort of, uh, I didn't say this explicitly, but yes, we've been always looking at the worst case error model. And whenever you look at worst case error model, many of the other natural ideas for locality tend to fail. So um, uh, yeah, I, I guess we didn't do this explicitly, but I would suspect it, uh, in the worst case error setting, convolutional codes should not work. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question was, can I say something about the required field size for the multiplicity codes? Actually, the right question should be, can you say something about the required alphabet size for the multiplicity codes? Because one thing that happens in the multiplicity codes is that your alphabet is no longer a single field element, but rather a collection of field elements corresponding to the polynomial and its derivatives. And, and uh, one of the concrete uh, shortcomings of these codes are really that uh, the f alphabet size grows pretty quickly. Uh, of course, we can do something like concatenation later to bring the alphabet size down, but along the way you start losing some of the concrete utility in the parameters. Asymptotically, things look nice. Uh, for small settings, it's not great. Though I must say, there is a paper by, uh, the original paper by Koparthi, Saraf, and Ekhanen, and consider this m my contribution to their paper, I forced them to write down at least some concrete settings of parameters where something non-trivial can be done. It's not too bad. It's not great, but there are moderate-sized alphabets where you actually get significant sublinear savings. They, they do mention the numbers specifically. Okay, maybe one last question. Yes. So maybe I'll just make one uh, question slash comment. It seems like uh, even with regenerating codes, the alphabet is a vector alphabet. And here also it seems like you're ending up with codes where the alphabet is not scalars but vectors. It seems like maybe that's the interesting direction. We have more flexibility with a vector alphabet than a scale. Right, yeah, uh, I should have said, you know, the first side when I said we're going to be talking about linear codes, I've you know, I was just shirking in my mind saying actually most of the codes that we are talking about are not linear codes. They are not, the alphabet is not a finite field and uh, uh, actually alphabets are very often vectors. And indeed, I think the folded reed Solomon codes that uh, Guru Swami and Rudra have worked with or Parvarish and Vardy have worked with and uh, um, uh, these multiplicity codes uh, and, and the regenerating codes as well. I mean, many cases we are seeing that uh, the a setting where the alphabet is a vector space rather than a field is giving us lots of new possibilities. And uh, by the way, a lot of the basic things that we learn about coding theory starts to break down also when you use vectors as uh, uh, when your alphabet, use your alphabet to be vectors. Like tensor products of codes are no longer well defined or well conceived. So. Uh, these are very interesting times. Uh, many of the things that we know don't hold, but on the other hand, many things are possible uh, with the vector alphabet. And yes, that's a great point. I think it's something that we should probably think about more uh, in the future. Okay. With that, uh, let's thank Madhu again for an excellent talk. Thank you.